ask me questions and we will interact with one another. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. Now, the Apostle Paul is talking to believers. He's talking to Christians who have been born again, but were not living in the truth that God had already set them free from the curse of the law. And I find that we are in a similar situation today. We know we are born again, but we don't know that we have been redeemed from the curse of the law. The nature of any law, if you break it, there's consequences and it's a curse. You agree with me? If there is no consequence to breaking a law, there's no use of making a law. And so every law in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, and if you read Deuteronomy 28, it says, when you disobey a law, there is a curse that comes as a consequence to the breaking of that law. So now when Jesus died on the cross, he not only died for our sins to be forgiven, he died for the curse to be broken over our lives. Because all of us are lawbreakers, am I right? Anyone who never broke a law in your life, you must be an angel. We've all violated and broken God's law. Forget about the civil law. God's law we've broken and violated. And as a result of that, we have placed ourselves in, under a curse and we continue to live life in that place of a curse rather than in a blessing. So when you read Galatians chapter 3, 13 it says Christ redeemed you from the curse of the law by becoming a curse Jesus took that curse on that cross so that we can be redeemed from that curse and then it was says in verse 14 the blessing of Abraham he redeemed us from the curse so that the blessing of Abraham might come to us isn't it true it's a blessing of Abraham. So what stops us from receiving the blessing is an undealt curse in our life. What is the blessings of Abraham? Can you shout out some of the blessings? Okay. You don't know the blessing? We, okay. okay. God spoke to Abraham of sacrificing his one and only son. And God was so impressed and blessed by Abraham's obedience that not, only, not, not even his son could come in the way of his obedience to God. That's a high level of obedience. And then God says, I will bless you going out and I will bless you coming in. I will make you the head and not the tail. I will bless your cattle or I'll bless your business. I will bless your family and none of these sicknesses will come upon you. He says everything you put your hands to will be blessed. They that curse you, I will curse. They that bless you, I will bless. And all of these blessings of prosperity and well-being was spoken over Abraham's life. And now God is saying to us in the New Testament, we don't have to sacrifice a son, but we got to believe that God gave a son. And when we believe that Jesus, the Son of God, the Lamb of God died for our sin, we, have, we can receive everything that God spoke to Abraham can come to us. And we must believe the blessings of Abraham. We must walk in the blessing of Abraham because Jesus died, redeemed us from the curse of the law so that the blessing of Abraham might come to us as Gentiles. God wants to bless you. I want to, and when you read the Bible, it looks like God wants an excuse to pour out a blessing upon our life. You agree with me? Say, God wants to bless me. Bless Tell someone next to you, God wants to bless and prosper you. That's the heart of God. He redeemed you so that we will be blessed. We are not only the children of God, we are the children of Abraham. Why Abraham? Because God fulfilled the promise he made to Abraham into our, into our lives where we can receive the blessing of God.
Now, when the Bible says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, if I pledged my watch and I took a sum of money, they give me a receipt. When I have sufficient amount of money, what do I do? I redeem. That's the word you use. That's the word even the secular world will use. You redeem your watch. I redeem my watch. Now when I'm redeeming my watch, I can't redeem someone else's watch and say, no, I like this watch better than mine. Give me that and I'll pay you the money. You can't do that. You can only redeem what is yours. And that's why you identify with what is yours by a slip of paper, a receipt saying, this is yours and you can redeem it when you pay back that money. God's word uses this, the Bible uses this word redeem specifically to show that all of mankind belong to God. Every single human being is a creation of God on planet earth. But because man lost his connection with God, man began to search for God and as a result made rituals and, and, and form, formed religions all over the world. And every religion has only one common theme and that theme is I want to get to know God. I want to draw closer to God. Religion is very different from Christianity. Religion is man's search towards God. Christianity is God's search towards man. Isn't that amazing? And today we are sitting here because God found you. You didn't find God. God found you. We ran away from God. We didn't want to have anything to do with God. God found you. And that's what Christianity is. That's what God did in, in, in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. God went and found them. So all religion is man-made. Every religion. Every religion is man putting his faith in his own works in order to receive something from God. Please, for God's sake, don't make Christianity another religion. Your faith is not in your works. Your faith is in Christ, the Lamb of God, who God sent for your salvation. Christ redeemed us. Christ brought us back to that place where we would be redeemed in our spirit, our body, and even in our circumstances. He redeemed us so that the blessing of Abraham will come upon our life. We're just going to look at two root causes for a curse. And the first one is in Exodus chapter 20 verse 3 to 5. And God says this to uh, Moses. You shall have no other gods before me. Now before we do that, there's a slip of paper. Pastor, we have that slip of paper. It's in the books. You see three columns there in your books. There's a sheet of paper. What happened? No book. You need the book. Take, get a piece of thing. We'll give her a sh Two minutes, okay. So in two minutes time it'll come. If you don't, uh, so if you have it, show what paper you have. Not that one, not that one, not that one. No, it's three columns, four columns, three or four columns. It's here, okay. Here, this is a sheet. You'll get one. We'll distribute each one. Get a copy, yeah. Hmm? All got a sheet of paper? Yes. yes. So now the first column is talking about false gods. 
Okay. This is what Exodus 23 to 5 says. You shall have no other gods before me or no other false god. Islam is a false god. Nice to say that in this nation. And so if you've been a worshipper of Allah, please put it down. Write it on the column. If you're coming to, from a place where you worshipped your ancestors, and ancestral worship is a common thing among Kurgis as well as Northeast uh, uh, people. Hey, Philippines, worshipping your ancestors is very common. Yeah? Uh, certain places. So if you worship ancestors, put it right there. I was shocked when we went through Malaysia. Someone's from Malaysia. You went through past Mal uh, uh, through Malaysia. They have these ancestral homes outside the home for their spirits to reside. And I was shocked. They even make a home for them. You're, invite you're inviting trouble. And if you've done things like that, please put it in this column. Okay, if you have if you have followed gurus, gurus uh, give you advice what to do, what not to do, where to go, how to do things. You put that in your list. Okay, now I'm not talking about after born again, before born again. Whenever you did it in your lifetime, write it down. Okay, I'll tell you why as we go on. Okay, if at any moment of your life you have fa fallen into this category, please write down false gods. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Then it goes on to say in verse 4, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or that is in the earth beneath and or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or nor serve them. Now another word for carved image is what? Idols. Another word for idols is what? Statues. All dictionary meaning, not my meaning, not no interpretation, simple dictionary. You open and you will find it. There's the same. I love the way the Bible uses the word carved images. It's a general word that speaks of anything which is in the form of an idol. And gee, God's word says this right there in the beginning. You shall not make for yourself an, a carved image in the likeness of anything. Can you say the word anything? anything. Loudly anything. anything. What does anything mean? Anything. Brilliant revelation you got. Fantastic. What does anything mean? Anything. anything. So don't make excuses for what you have at home. Oh, what about this one? Anything means anything. You shall not make a calm image for yourself in the likeness of anything. Where? In the heaven above, on the earth, or even below the water. Then it goes on to say, you shall not bow down to them, or venerate them, or worship them, nor serve them. How do we serve? How do people serve these carved images? Lighting candles, putting garlands, um, you know, offering food, uh, sacrifices uh, to these uh, carved images. All of that, people wash the idols, carry the idols, all of that is serving the idols or serving the carved images. And God says, you shall not bow down or serve them. Now, why does the Bible says you shall not bow down? Because bowing down is an act of worship. What is bowing down? An act of worship. Every time you bow down, you are worshipping a calmed image or you are worshipping an individual. Now what is worship? Worship is spiritual. Every time you worship God, we lift our hands, we bow down, we kneel, we prostrate on the floor and all of these uh, actions of ours indicate surrender to God. So all worship is about surrender to God. When you come here to worship God, you are surrendering your spirit, your soul and your body to God. And as a result of that, God is a spirit, John chapter 4 verse 24. And when we worship God who is a spirit, then something of God's spirit comes into our being. And that's when we feel joy, we feel 
we feel the peace of God we feel the love of God right there in our spirit because there's an intermingling between God's spirit and our spirit that's what worship does you go anywhere in the world every time a person worships there is surrender to that deity because all worship is about surrender and that's why God says you shall not bow down or serve them because when you surrender to them something of that spirit comes into you when we worship God God's spirit comes into us in the past you have worshipped idols or carved images or false god something of the spirit of false god has come into us ouch And that's why we wonder why we can't progress in life. That's why we can't see breakthroughs in our life. Because not only we've deliberately broken God's law and placed ourselves under a curse, we've not even accepted the solution that the Bible gives to us in Galatians chapter 3 where God declares Christ has redeemed you. It's a fight. It's done. It's finished. But we need to receive the, from the finished work of Christ. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law so that we can move from curse to blessing please write in your notes all worship is spiritual can you say that after me all worship is all worship is and I want you to know that every time you worship you are engaging in spiritual activity true yes or no Yes, we're not just singing songs to keep us happy and have fun. We're singing songs and we're worshipping God. We are interacting with the spiritual world. Every form of worship is, is. And so when you have engaged in something spiritual which is not of God, you have made yourself vulnerable to the kingdom of darkness. You know, in 80... In 88, that's a long time, 30 years now we're pastoring this uh, church, at night church. In the second year when I started the church, we were worshipping in a, in a home which had a side room and God was blessing the work, people were coming and because of the overflow they were sitting in a side room like that. And this visitor who came during worship collapsed and so they decided to pray for him. And while they were praying for him in the room, slowly I was seeing people from the room come to the main hall. And I'm wondering, this is strange, why is everyone coming out from that room and looking for a place in the main hall? So I thought, let me go and see. There were only two people there. One the person who brought him and the other one who was manifesting. And as soon as he saw me, his eyes were big, his tongue came out and he came to hit. Ah, he came to hit. And I immediately knew it was the spirit of Kali. So I stood my ground and I said, you spirit of Kali, come out of him right now in Jesus' name. And it grew violent. The spirit in him was manifesting. Till finally, the, the, he buckled in his knees, collapsed on the ground and he was set free. And I was able to lead him to Christ. He had a wonderful experience of knowing Jesus. How did the spirit of Kali come into him? He was a worshipper of Kali. And so whoever you worship, you are interacting with the spiritual world of darkness. And so he went home happy. The next Sunday he came to me and he says, Pastor, uh, I want you to pray for my cow. I said, you want me to pray for your cow? I said, what happened to your cow? He says, the time I went home, my cow stopped giving milk whole week is not giving milk and I'm thinking myself how I'm going to pray for a cow I never prayed for a cow before I'm not going to cast out a demon from a cow it charges me when it chases me I don't know where I will run I said I'm not going to take any chances and my mind was racing to and fro how to deal with this person's problem one thing I like about new believers new believers are actual believers when we grow mature we don't believe <laughs> we doubt we question 
So I quickly came with this verse. I said, you know what the Bible says? When two agree touching anything on earth, God will hear in heaven and he will answer. Do you believe? Of course he's a, he will believe. He's a new believer. He just saw deliverance. So he'll believe anything I tell him. <laughs> So I held his hand, I prayed like I never did be prayed before. God in the name of Jesus, that demon of Kali that went out from him into school, come out in Jesus' name. And from Monday till Saturday, I was praying for his cow. <laughs> and I was so, he's a new believer. And he must experience something positive, not something negative. I'm saying, God, I pray Lord. You, are, you know, he had more faith than me. And when I saw him the next Sunday, I was so relieved. I forgot to ask him, how are you? I said, how's your cow? <laughs> and he looks at me so casual. Fine, I went to him, I had milk. Look, so started giving milk. And I'm thinking, started giving. That time we didn't have SMS. He didn't have phone. So you can't, your whole suspense, the whole week I was living in suspense. And he's so casual. He says, yeah, I went to him, cow started giving milk. And I thought I was the unbeliever at that moment. Whole week I was an unbeliever. God do it. God, do it. God must have been smiling. <laughs> Why am I sharing the story? Because demons not only inhabit human beings, demons also inhabit animals. Because demons are looking for a body. And that's why the foundations were important. As much as God needs a body, the devil needs a body in order to fulfill its work. And is looking for a body. Don't make a theology of not eating pork because demons went into the pig and it ran into the, into the lake. You know why demons went into the pig? Because pigs were around. If there were dogs, it would have gone into dogs. If there were cows, it would have gone into a cow. It would go into any body that's there, so it can inhabit it. How many kingdoms there are? What are the two kingdoms? There is no in-between kingdom. And all your worship will either go to God or will go to the enemy. It doesn't hit the roof. I wish it did. But there's no such thing as hitting the roof. It goes somewhere. And either God or the enemy. What is this? A simple chair. Nothing wrong with this chair. But if people came here, put a garland on this chair, broke one coconut and started to chant Saint Chair, Saint Chair, Saint Chair, give me a miracle, Saint Chair or Guruji Chair, Guruji Chair, Guruji Chair. After six months they'll get a miracle. Guess what they will do? Hey, you go to this place in Doha, you take one candle, one coconut, you break it and you chant this 20 times, you'll get a miracle. In six months or one year, you'll get a crowd coming here yeah, worshipping Saint Jai or Guruji Jai. How many of you seen this happening? I've seen it. And if you're coming from our beloved nation, you see whatever starts, one small anthill at the side of the road, before you know anything, one monument has come there or whatever that is called. Why? Because Satan says, if your worship doesn't go to God, by default it comes to me. You call me anything. You call me Guruji Chai, Saint Chai, you call me anything. We, have, we don't have an identity crisis. All we want, if it's not going to God, then it will come to me. We will fight my God, your God. Devils is all same kingdom. Same kingdom. That's why I said worship is spiritual. When Lucifer was in heaven, what did he want? Worship. He says, I want to be like the most high God. I want to be exalted there in heaven. He was looking for worship. When he was cast down to the earth, what was Satan looking for? Worship. He took Jesus to the pinnacle. He says, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. If you could only bow down and worship me. What a big deal he was offering Jesus. Worship. Because he knew if Jesus worshipped him, he would get him as well as the kingdom. That's all he's looking for. 
Till today, the enemy is all after people get, giving them his worship. That's what the devil wants, worship. He will do anything to get your devotion and to get your worship so he can keep you spiritually bound for the rest of your life. Yes. Uh, it's always good to pray with their knowledge, not without their knowledge. Huh? That's difficult. It's difficult when there's no truth. And so, uh, I wish we had more time to spend with you all, but we do a prayer ministry training after this, uh, separate course. Jesus' model, he would preach the gospel, then he would heal the sick and cast out demons. We want to go straight to cast out demons without the preaching of the gospel. Doesn't work that way. It always comes with preaching the gospel and then casting out the demons. That's when, they, there's, that's when conviction comes, revelation comes, so that God can work in the person's life. Hmm? So on your sheet, you will have a long list probably, some of you, to write down some of the religious places, the, the places of worship you went to. Okay, you can write that down. We'll even have a break time. You, you probably, now you won't have all the time. We'll give you a break. During the break, you can start writing. But if it, something comes immediately to your mind, you can write it down. There's things that we need to cover. Why did God say you shall not have false gods or you shall not bow down to carved images? It goes on to say in Exodus 20, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, did you see that quality about God? He is a jealous God. He visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And I will be doing the teaching of that in the last session today. But God's character is, a, is jealous. He's a jealous God. He's not jealous the way we know jealousy in a twisted way. His jealousy is more like a husband and wife devoted and committed to one another. No wife likes to see her husband flirt around with another man or a woman. <laughs> Both now is relevant. No husband likes to see his wife flirt around with a man or a woman. No. Why? Because there's a sense of ownership. There's a sense of commitment and, and dedication to the other person. And God is saying, I love you with a jealous love. There's my ownership upon, uh, uh, upon you. I want your wholeheartedness as I have given my whole self to you. And that's the kind of relationship God wants to share with us. Christianity should never be a relationship of bondage. It just should be a relationship of bonding. The bonding, the sonship, the father-son relationship. Exodus 34 verse 14 says, Do not worship any other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 32 16, And they made him jealous with their foreign gods, with idols and carved images, and angered him with their detestable idols. And so pr 